Итак, прежде чем мы с вами вновь submerge into the depths of God's wisdom, which is our inheritance in Jesus Christ, the unchanging epigraph of the study of the word of God, our inheritance, is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And for us, as partakers of the body of Christ, to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about Him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so we can put on the new form of life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which is created in accordance to God in true righteousness and holiness and as we know to fulfill this command we need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs and these are to put off be renewed and put on we've noted that your decision regarding these three destiny affecting actions put off be renewed and put on will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or vessel of wrath or more specifically will the accomplishing of our salvation come to pass that is given to us in the format of a guarantee or will we lose it forever in result then our names be forever blotted out of the book of life although they may have been written there at one time in a specific format we have already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the third question what conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind we begin the process of dressing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth and righteousness and holy truth as we could see and when we speak of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ in the all armor of light we've concluded that we need God's help in the form of his redeeming mercy the means of receiving any kind of help in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of the Lord is weaponry of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth a unique prayer and unique worship that could be in accordance to the will of God and accordance to the Holy Scriptures, since prayer isn't just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God. Man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the territory of earth. Relevant here is one of the prayers of David, written in the 143rd Psalm. The Psalm very clearly opens for us the conditions, the grounds upon which a person is called to prepare a legal foundation for God, so that God would intervene with His mercy into our life, intervene also within the boundaries of, for which we carry responsibility for before God. This has become the subject we've been studying. Of course, we could turn to any Psalm, or any other place of Scripture for that matter, these principles are all over the Bible, but the scriptures, God has chosen this place of scripture specifically so that we study it here. Let's submerge into its waters, Psalm 143, 1 through 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in the darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, like, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. 
Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. For David, as well as for us, to hear the mercy of God early, we, like David, needed to present to God legal grounds or a specific right. And such evidence in this prayer, as we know, were ten in unique in their nature arguments demonstrating the right to enter into the presence of God that David gave to God, saying, Hear me because of your faithfulness and your righteousness, because I remember the days of old. Old, I meditate on all your works, because I spread out my hands to you. Hear me because I trust in you. Hear me because I lift up my soul to you. Hear me because in you I take shelter. Hear me for you are my God. Hear me for your name's sake. Hear me for your righteousness' sake, and hear me, for I am your servant. According to the consistency of the given prayer, we've established that the reason for it was a specific category of enemies that confronted David. These were his personal flesh, his personified sin, and personified death. And to be heard by God, David presented to God these ten arguments. And it was the phrase, a psalm of David, that accompanied all of these forms of evidence. Aside from the obvious simplicity of this phrase, it symbolically signifies the organic connection of the one praying to the body of the Lord, that is, an organic membership to a domestic church, upon the place where every kind of prayer needs to be made, because the consistency included in the word psalm is a choir song accompanied by entire orchestra, consisting of numerous different instruments. This symbolizes the church and each individual member called to fulfill their exclusive role in the body of Christ. At the same time, David himself symbolized Christ as one of the meanings of his name is beloved by God. As what was also said was said about Jesus Christ, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. And the other, the name of David, directs to one of the names of Christ. It reveals his root and his descendant. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of, offspring of David, the bright and morning star, Revelations 22.16. This is why the phrase, a psalm of David, symbolically presents the church of Christ or the holy people who have dedicated themselves to present the interests of Christ. Therefore, the meaning included in the phrase, a psalm of David, directs to the fact that all process, processes occurring within the psalm from one side are lawful or legit only when they happen within the church, that according to scripture is the sovereign territory of the kingdom of heaven on earth. From the other side is that all of these processes are called to form each of its demonstrators into the image of God. Therefore, every prayer made by man spoken to spoken to provide God the right to perform his work in us upon earth can only be legitimate in the situation when we have an orga or not only an organizational but also organic membership to the body of Christ, membership to a domestic church. Therefore, any l religious organization not being a church of Christ or reconciling or uniting the teachings of Christ with the teaching of Buddha, Confucian, or, Muh or Muhammad. There are large Christian so-called churches like Yang Gecho, for example. He unites all of these teachings. Uh, they say that he says Buddha, the teaching of Buddhism, and the teaching of Christianity are, the, are, are of similar root and both lead to the same place. And so he does everything to reconcile the two together, unite them. We need to understand that any teaching that does this uh, unites Confucians or Muhammad or is a religious of the Antichrist and cannot be the delegated path to God. There's only one way to God and one path and only one meteor, Jesus Christ. And Buddha didn't say this about himself or Muhammad, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one had said this. 
In the previous services, we had already studied the nature of the first argument that abided in David's heart. This was evidence that faithfulness and righteousness abided in David's heart. This served as legal grounds for God, giving God the ability to hear David and to stand on the side of David in his oppositions against his enemies. And stop to study the second argument. This was the presented by David evidence that in his heart the memories of the days of old were imprinted and all of the deeds that God had done in those old days, not just imprinted, but continually abided in him, and he continually meditated about them. According to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, we began to study the form of this evidence in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest. This item is a unique and continual memorial before God, identifying with itself continual prayer. The breastplate of judgment, as we know, was created and served only one item. This was the urim and the thummim, the unification of the two within the heart of a man, the presence of which allowed God to hear man and allowed man to hear God. Therefore, to be heard by God in the revelations of his urim, which we see here as the Holy Spirit, it is necessary to keep within your mind the works of God that he had done in the days of old, being his thummim, the elementary teachings of Christ that the Lord had done in the days of old and presented it in symbols and other things. The breastplate of judgment as a continual memorial before God is the sacral symbol of the format of continual prayer, providing God grounds to fulfill His will upon planet Earth. Prayer that does not satisfy the requirements and characteristics of the breastplate of judgment does not have the right to be called prayer. And further, a person praying such a prayer does not have the right to be called a warrior in prayer from the position of being a king and a priest cannot be called a warrior in prayer, therefore also does not have the right to approach God as an intercessor. Many people can pray and sometimes God even hears prayers of people who aren't Christian or, or unfamiliar with God, but this person says, Lord, if you exist, save me, and God can save him, give him a chance so that he turn to him. But that does not mean that this person is an intercessor and can enter into the presence of God as we said, Hagar prayed, but she was not able to enter the presence of God, and she was not the church. She was a servant. The symbol of the church was Sarah, who was, is the mother of all who believe. Abraham, the father of all who believe. As only... The format of continual prayer presented in the breastplate of the high priest gives us the right to come close to God and enter into the holy place as a king and a priest to God to present intercession that pursues the interests of God's will. To be a king is to have a renewed mind because only through that will everything happen through your renewed mind the rest of the renewal process will happen. You'll be dressed into your new person by the means of your renewed mind. And the priest is our new person in Christ Jesus. In the Septuagint, this is the translation of the 70 interpreters or rab rabbis who interpreted it, uh, translated from the original Hebrew. Uh, they translated it into Greek. And in doing so, this breastplate of judgment is called the sign of justice, as by the means of the Urim and the Thummim that is contained in the breastplate of judgment, God revealed to man his judgments. Symbolically, the breastplate of judgment identifies a conscience of a man purified from dead works, upon the tablets of whom, just as a sign it in the twelve names of the patriarchs, the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh is imprinted. The name of each patriarch contained the essence of some kind of teaching that which there are 12 of. A conscience purified of dead works with imprinted faithfulness and righteousness upon its tablets is called to give God the right to function in them and through them upon planet Earth. In a specific format, we have already looked at the measurement and ma nature of materials with which the breastplate of judgment was built that we are called to be in accordance to within our spirit and stop to study the next requirement that says, Exodus 20, 17 through 21, and you shall put settings of stone in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be serious, topaz, and emerald. The second row shall be turquoise, sapphire, and diamond. The third row shall be jacinth, agate, and amethyst. And the fourth row shall be beryl, onyx, and jasper. 
They shall be set in gold settings, and the stone shall have the names of the sons of Israel, according to the twelve names. Like the engraving of a signet, each one with its own name shall be according to the twelve tribes. We've noted that the twelve golden settings in the, is the authority, rule, and order of the Word of God containing the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, that we as worshippers of God are called to present within the foundation of our continual prayer. The twelve precious stones with engraved upon them as a signet, names of the sons of Israel, is a symbol and format of our continual prayer, presenting the perfect judgments of God. From this we can see that it wasn't the golden settings being the truth of the Word of God that were adjusted in measurement and configuration to fit the precious stones, but the precious stones themselves, being our prayers, are the ones that were adjusted and configured to fit the golden settings of truth. Continual prayer in the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment with the twelve names is a persisting prayer that in its intercession presents the interests of the will of God and does not sway away or step away from the goal until what is asked for is received. Building of the breastplate of judgment within our heart is revealed as building the kingdom of heaven in the image of the tree of life that bears fruit each month, twelve, not, twelve times it bears its fruit. <clears throat> and growing the tree of life within our heart, this tree of life, this new person, is building yourself into a new person created in accordance to God so that we can build ourselves into a spiritual house and holy priesthood. With, it, we, with this we note that all the beauty and order of the temple is created for one holy item and served that one item. This was the golden ark of the covenant. The same thing with the ephod of the high priest with the connected to it, breastplate of judgment. It was created for and served only one holy item. This item very accurately was called to duplicate and fulfill the function of the golden ark. This was the urim and the thummim the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's Word. Because the golden Ark of the Covenant, as well as the breastplate of judgment, symbolized from different angles and with various purposes, the conscience of a man cleansed from dead works. Urim and Thummim in Hebrew means light and perfection. Light is the revelation of the Holy Spirit, and light and perfection is the truth that the Holy Spirit reveals. Light and the right Again, we see light as the Holy Spirit, and the right is the right is the revelation of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit reveals God's revelations. The Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant is the truth. This, these Ten Commandments symbolized Christ, and this truth in the breastplate of judgment is the thummim symbolizing the teaching of Christ. The light revelation that a person could receive at the lid of the ark, or also known as mercy seat, is the urim in the breastplate of judgment. <clears throat> a worshiper of God is a person who has a wise heart, upon the tablets of whom the truth in the form of the thummim is imprinted within the boundaries of which the Urim, in the form of the Holy Spirit, could reveal the mysteries of the Thummim. I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you, Exodus 31, 6. We need to consider that a child or a spiritual infant, he re receives Christ he can receive baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, but the Holy Spirit will not come there as wisdom, as a revelation, because this person does not yet understand what the truth is. He is still attracted by various doctrines, and this one says this here, that one says there something there. He does not have a person that he can follow. He finds uh, things on the Internet, looks for different uh, preachers uh, on the television or where, wherever else. He, he has not found the delegated of God who was sent for him and has been placed over him. He does not yet know the church where he needs to be, thinking that all churches are the churches of God, if they have an attractive name, hope and so forth faithfulness or an anything people name their churches in very different names a morning star and so forth 
and you can call your church whatever you may like, but it's not the name that will determine who you are, but the inner essence. The friendship of the thumb and, and urim in the heart of a person is a unification of two formats of wisdom, which state that the carriers of the thummim and the urim are true worshippers of God and possess the immune system of the Holy Spirit. In a specific format, we have already looked at five qualities of a warrior in prayer in the five, first five precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, but which God was able to continuously reveal His will upon planet Earth, and stop to study the sixth quality and the precious diamond stone. We know that the sixth name carved upon the diamond stone of the breastplate of judgment upon the tablets of our heart is the name of the sixth son of Jacob, Naphtali, which means wrestler. And Rachel's maid Bela conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Genesis 37, 8. <clears throat> So again, one who prevailed in prayer, one who prevails in prayer, prevails over organized powers of hell that confront man when he tries to fulfill or works for, to fulfill the will of God. The name of God presented in the precious diamond stone, according to the Jewish rabbinate, is El Hai in Hebrew. The function of the sixth principle as a format of continual prayer is our right and our ability to allow the Holy Spirit to abide with us in our prayer battles against the powers of hell which confront us when we fulfill the will of God by the name of the living God. Jeremiah 10.10, 10, But the Lord is the true God, He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure His indignation. The name of the living God is a format of an oath and the category of the nation that had not learned to swear by the name of the living God or swore falsely were utterly destroyed. Jeremiah 12, 16, 17, And it shall be, if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name and the Lord, as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. So to not be plucked up and destroyed by the wrath of the living God, it is necessary to learn the ways of the nation of God to swear by the name of God El Hai, or by the living God. These ways are the paths of the commandments and statutes of God. The conditions that give us the right to learn the paths of God's commandments and statutes to swear by the name of the living God is the thirst to know them. And so you need to be a student and you need to thirst. I shall run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart when my heart will begin to bear fruit. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Psalm 119, 32 through 35. The name of God alive or living in Hebrew means abiding, one who is with unconditional authority, one who defines a Genesis, one who creates a Genesis, holds a Genesis, keeps a Genesis, rules over the Genesis, and commander and lord of the Genesis. Deuteronomy 10:20 20 through 21, it says, You shall fear the Lord your God. Here it shows when we can swear by the name of the living God. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve Him. When you have the fear of the Lord, you shall serve Him. When you don't have other idols in your heart, and to Him you shall hold fast. When you know how to hold fast to the Lord and take oath in His name. He is your praise and He is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. The power of a warrior in prayer contains, contained within the virtue of the name of the living God is called to present the unlimited power of God over the Genesis and the allotted by him for his time and boundaries. Therefore, it is necessary for us to look at and determine what goal God has in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer. Also, in what way and upon what conditions is God able and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer so that man may present the interests of God and implement or actualize his inheritance in God. According to the revelations written in Scripture, our prayer and the quality of a warrior in prayer, identified by the virtue of the brilliant stone, needs to be first continual, persistent, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with faith of your heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, in the Holy Spirit, or praying in tongues. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.
In the previous service, we in a specific format have already looked at seven components of continual prayer and stopped to study the eighth component. This is the fruit of joy. We've noted that the fruit of joy in the heart identifies the state of a heart of a warrior in prayer as well as the quality of this person's prayer. As it is written, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Proverbs 17:22. Therefore, one of the signs by which we need to determine the presence of joy that comes from above will be a merry heart that will serve as a medicinal substance, healing and restoring and repairing his faith and his trust in God. Not his wounds and not his sicknesses, but his faith and his trust by which he will be able to receive healing. A broken spirit, as we know, is a symbol of a hard heart that is directed by the pride of an unrenewed mind, where there is an absence of an atmosphere of upright joy, one depriving God of grounds or a foundation to do good and heal this person. Apostle Jude, concluding his short book to the Church of Christ, gave the quality of joy its own elevation and rank as an integral part of our salvation in Christ Jesus. Jude 1.24 now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Fault or blemish in joy is an absence of a foundation keeping us from stumbling into perdition to present us before his glory. If there is blemish in joy, God does not have this foundation to keep a man from stumbling into perdition. Secondly, the glory of God abides exclusively in the atmosphere of upright joy and is an expression of this upright joy. We know blemish or, blemishes or sin and joy is a stain or a flaw revealing impurity, abomination and deceit. A person who has not rid himself of such blemishes and joy, as well as in all other of his characteristics, will not be allowed in heaven. But there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation 21, 27. Determining the wellspring of unearthly joy and the existing in, these, in this joy natural qualities, we conclude that upright joy in prayer can come only from an upright heart. The heart expresses this upright joy. Our words and our actions manifest the state of upright joy. If within our heart we will abide within the atmosphere of upright joy, then our prayer will also express this upright joy. We need to differentiate earthly joy from joy that is supernatural. The supernatural joy has its distinctive roots in God, its distinctive wellspring in God, and its distinctive genesis in God. By themselves, we know that two nat natures of joy are two programs that come from different nature springs, God and the fallen cherubim. The heart of a man is a programmable system, and that nature of joy to which man gives his consideration and his preference dresses him and rules in his essence, as well as that person from whom this joy comes will be the God of this person. And if we consider or prefer earthly joy, then it, from one side, will be the means we measure our relationship with God, and from the other side, and we will not even be suspicious that our God is actually the fallen cherubim. In the case, if you, when you see dancing Christians joyful and glad, you truly think that they their God is the God of joy, but actually many of these people, their God is the fallen cherubim, but they don't see this because they don't differentiate supernatural joy from natural joy. And from the other side, <clears throat> earthly joy will always suppress and oppress supernatural joy. If we will consider the joy that comes from above, then it also will be the means by which we measure our relationship with God. Due to its supernaturalism, unearthly joy is not able to be experienced or felt upon the level of our physical abilities. As unlike worldly joy, it isn't a kind of emotion or a kind of feeling that lifts your mood. 
Supernatural joy is a kind of discipline of the mind and heart, which creates peace in the heart of a man as well as balances, controls, and leads our feelings. And sometimes they may be irritated, these feelings, but it controls them. Therefore, upright joy is a component of prayer, is the confession of the faith of the heart, confessing who God is to us in Christ Jesus and what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Also, who we are for God in Christ Jesus. And such confession of the faith of the heart and power will be equal to the power of the word that comes out of the mouth of God. Turning our attention to the unique wisdoms of Scripture in defining unearthly joy, we've decided to look at the virtues of upright joy only within the heart of a man, born from the imperishable seed of the word of truth, abiding within Christ. The example and criteria identifying the quality and nature of upright joy is God himself. Therefore, this upright joy is not only the quality of God and the atmosphere in which God abides, it is also one of his glorious names with which he triumphs over his enemies. Psalm 43, 4, 5, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? You see where he says, I will go to the altar of God. Sometimes your soul could be in sorrow at this at this time. Your feelings will not be feeling this joy, but he will still go to the altar of God. And what will I say? I will say to my soul, he starts communicating with himself. This is very important. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. You know, this kind of concept used to be seen by psychiatrists as a person who's a schizophrenic, who speaks with himself, a person. When I used to have to walk around, I had nowhere to go to pray, so I walked around and prayed. And I would be walking and praying, and uh, a military psychologist would approach me and listen to what I say, and he, and he says, uh, continue to, continue to, to do what, sh- what you're doing. And I said, no, you're interrupting. And, and he asked, How, with, with, with what voice does he respond to you? Uh, and, I, and I told him, sometimes it's a female voice, sometimes a male voice. And so he understood what I was actually saying. And I told him, you don't understand these things because you're a foolish person. And so those academics that came to you, he asked, who are they? And, he, and, and I said, they are also uh, foolish people. And so to define, determine the essence of supernatural joy as well as the conditions that we need to fulfill to grow and demonstrate its virtue in our prayer, we have been looking at four aspects, defining the essence and purpose of the fruit of joy, the price of obtaining and expressing the fruit of joy, keeping and developing the fruit of joy, the fruits and rewards for demonstrating upright joy in prayer. In a specific format, we have already looked at the first two questions, therefore we'll immediately turn to look at the third question. What conditions do we need to fulfill to keep and increase the fruit of upright joy in prayer. Looking at this question, we've also already studied the six conditions providing grounds and the ability for keeping and increasing the fruit of upright joy in prayer. Therefore, we will immediately begin studying the seventh condition. I will list those first six that we have already studied, remind us of them. The first component contained in keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is the sanctification of our all-capturing redemption, capturing the spirit, soul, and body. Second component contained in keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is celebrating the Feast of Booths. Third component contained in keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, offering great sacrifices, first fruits, and tithes. Fourth component contained in keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is obtaining the lawful right to avenge yourself against your enemies, these enemies being a carnal, sinful beginning in man, and the supporting of it unclean and lawless men. Fifth component contained in keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is the state of the heart of the righteous one who knows the bitterness of his soul and the stranger who does not share his joy.
Sixth component contained in keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is the ability to perform the peace of God. The seventh component contained in keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is waiting for the fulfillment of our hope. Eighth condition for keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is the timely confessions of the faith of the heart received in the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Ninth condition for keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is our kindness towards the category of God's chosen remnant. And tenth condition for keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is to do the justice of God. It is a joy for the just to do justice, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. Proverbs 21, 15. According to the above-read proverb, we can see that joy that is not a result of the selective love of God, demonstrated in doing justice, established and immortalized in Scripture, cannot be called or be the fruit of upright joy in prayer. More or less, this means that during the demonstration of the selective love of God, demonstrated in doing justice, we are called to demonstrate the will of heaven on earth within, within the boundaries of the law of sowing and reaping identifying the changeless great justice of God we being the vessels of God express blessing upon the vessels of mercy and pour out curse upon the vessels of wrath or vessels of death Job 37 11 through 16 also with moisture God saturates the thick clouds and scatters his bright clouds and the swirl about being turned by his guidance that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth he causes it to come whether for correction or for his land or for his mercy listen to this O Job stand still and consider the wondrous works of God do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his clouds to shine do you know how the clouds are balanced those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge here of course it's not talking about simple clouds that we know but children of God who are clouds that are filled with moisture if we will not allow the Holy Spirit to fill us with the moisture of the thoughts of God that would be able to scatter His bright clouds and swirl about being turned by His guidance, that we do whatever He commands us on the face of the whole earth for correction or for mercy, we transform into a cloud that is turned by a storm or various winds of, do of deception for whom is prepared for the gloom of eternal darkness. Here's what it says in Second Peter 2.17-22. These are the wells without water, clouds, carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. And so these are the swelling words of emptiness are God's deeds and words that are spoken but are not within their heart. It's not present in the heart. It's just empty words. In this way, they escape from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered to them but it but the, it has happened to them according to the true proverb a dog returns to its own vomit and a so having washed her wa having washed her wallows in her mire when I read this place of scripture people be there are people that became angry I remember and said they call us pigs and I I, I was surprised that they would think this, that they would apply this to themselves. Looking at the above read prophetic words, we conclude that if a person is born from the seed of the word of truth, but refuses to be a carrier of the selective love of God, where he would be able to demonstrate the just judgments of God presented in Scripture, going and increasing the quality of the fruit of its upright joy, then this person will be seen, according to Scripture, as a dog who returns to its own vomit and as a pig who goes to wallow in its own dirt. Psalm 149, 5 through 9. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. 
to execute on them the written judgment, this honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord, Psalm 149, 5 through 9. And so this honor is for the saints, as it is written. The unclean are people who previously were holy but refused to be carriers of the selective love of God. Their phrase today is, God loves everyone and we need to love everybody. That's how be they become unclean. Summing up this condition, we conclude that growing and developing the fruit of upright joy in su is such a justice that satisfied the requirements of the written word of God. Eleventh condition for keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is the necessity to have fellowship with God by having fellowship with His delegated ones, those who carry the good news. 1 John 1, through, 1, 2 through 4. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. In the given testimony and words of Apostle John to the Church of Christ, the foundation for growing and increasing the fruit of upright joy in yourself is fellowship, so that you may have fellowship with us, then your joy will be full. That in these words, these words we see simultaneously presented as an atmosphere as well as a binding or tying element by the means of which a f familiar relationship is built with God by having a similar relationship with his apostles. With this we need to keep in mind that fellowship with the apostles is concurrently seen as fellowship with each other. Therefore, when the word fellowship takes part and is applied in the relationship with his delegated people, then it is one and the same. But when this very word is applied in the relationship with God, then although it has a somewhat similarity in the relationship with his delegated people, it carries a somewhat different meaning. Fellowship with the apostles is, is assembly, relationship, partaking, joining, contact, making this is talking about joining each other, contact with each other, making a union or making a covenant or agreement. When a person makes an agreement, he becomes a member of some kind of group. Collaboration, binding to sociability, charity, and sacrifice. When it's talking about fellowship with God, then in, in Hebrew, it's a close or relative communication, a warm conversation happening in the cool of the day partaking and contact but directly with God making a union or making an agreement but only with God collaboration binding to but binding to God taking part in God's counsel taking part in the thoughts of God trusting man with the mysteries of God taking part in the circle of God's friends and gathering with God remember what Moses said this is the one that was in the wilderness with me and in this council so what council would he be talking about when it was just him and God according to the definition listed when the word fellowship is applied in the relationship with each other together with his, with his delegated person as the head then it fulfills one other significantly important purpose without which it is impossible to make your, your salvation a reality this is the rightful and lawful ability and atmosphere giving the blood of Christ power to cleanse us from all sin, specifically in fellowship with each other. The blood of Jesus Christ receives the ability to cleanse us from all sin. 1 John 1, 6 through 7, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie to do and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you can imagine the body of a person, blood continually cleanses the body inside. Not periodically, but continuously. And because we continually receive food and this food has elements that the body doesn't need they're actually poisoning and blood takes the those things that are nourishing but those that are poisoned or or unnecessary it pushes out of the body but it works in the body the blood if a person is out of the body out of a church 
The blood of Jesus Christ is not able to cleanse him from sin, even if he confessed his sins. It will not cleanse him. And so this word fellowship is very important. Apostle Paul identifies and links fellowship of the holy people with each other in Christ as their uniting in one spirit and one mind to create a body. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that you perfectly join together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 through 10. If you are within the church, but you have a different opinion, or you are not agreeing with the teaching that is presented there, the blood of Jesus is not able to cleanse you from sin. Leave these kinds of churches or change yourself. And of course, if we have fellowship with God in Christ Jesus by having fellowship with His delegated people and all the saints, it is necessary to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit because it is He who will be uh, who will be creating this power in the relationship, this fellowship. He is the atmosphere of this fellowship and power that unites all of these forms of fellowship. Second Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Pay attention how these are shown in which order. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all. Amen. The Holy Spirit makes it possible. He is that means, that that fellowship, that path upon which we can uh, have this grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus and love of the Father, as well as fellowship with each other. He's that path. He's that uh, means by which this can happen. With this, we need to note that fellowship of the Holy Spirit, by which the delegate people of God, revealed to us the mysteries of God the Father and God the Son, is placed in direct dependence of our fellowship with God's delegated persons, those who carry the word about the kingdom of heaven within the boundaries of which the Holy Spirit builds our fellowship with Him, with Himself by the means of the revelations we hear. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called my name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver, in bronze, and cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I indeed have appointed with him Ahelib, the son of Esamech, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. Here are the two people presented as the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. This is Exodus 31, 1 through 6. As this is Bezalel, the son of Uri, and Ahiliab, the son of Azamek. And so, and Heliab here demonstrates the elementary teachings of Christ. And so, understandably, we need to remember that all the forms of fellowship with God, by having fellowship with His delegated persons within the atmosphere of which our joy is called to grow into perfection, is able to grow, develop, and be kept kept from being ruined, it is necessary not to communicate or make any sort of agreements with the unfaithful and lawless who support the unclean. This is another condition so that this fellowship can be and so that we can, by this fellowship, receive this great joy that we can grow into perfection. Second Chronicles 20, 35-37 after this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied, allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted very wickedly. And so Judah was a, a godly king, and Ahaziah, king of Israel, acted wickedly. And he allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Ezion Geber. But Eliezer, the son of Dodova of Maresh, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked, so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. This is what tolerant love does. It will bring those that fear the Lord, if they have this tolerant love, 
to shipwreck. According to the given testimony, we conclude that as soon as godly people start to fellowship with people who are lawless or those who support the lawless, their godliness loses its power and they, ca and they call upon themselves the wrath of God. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Do not make these contracts, covenants, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols, for you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people, therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Summing up the given condition, we conclude that growing and developing the fruit of upright joy is fellowship with only those people that God placed over us, that have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Not with those people that God has placed over others, but whom God has placed over us. Because you can be in one church, but continuously attempt to receive information from others and say, well, this is also God's person. Yes, he may be, but he's not the one placed for you. You need to have your own husband. If you're going to turn to all husbands, then you will be a prostitute and not as a married woman. Twelfth condition for keeping and developing the fruit of upright joy in prayer is the necessity to ask for the promise of full peace before God in the format of intercession of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We need to ask that God fulfill this promise that fill us with full, this full peace and we need to present our prayer as the prayer of Jesus Christ, the intercession of Jesus Christ. John 17, 13, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And so when we pray, we need to say, Heavenly Father, I present to you the prayer of your Son, Jesus Christ. May you fill me with the promise of your joy, the fullness of joy that he prayed to you about in the Gethsemane Mount. You don't ask from yourself, you ask in his name. You dress your prayer in the format of the prayer of the Son of God himself. This is very important, an important, truly important component without which all of the previous conditions for growing and developing in yourself the fruit of upright joy will not be able to happen. Therefore, any form of intercession needs to be dressed into the format of, an er of the intercession of Jesus Christ. He stands as mediator between man and God. As it is written, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be, set, testif to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 2.5.6 Dressing any of your requests into the format of the intercession of Jesus Christ, we present in our intercession the will of God that provides God grounds to hear us in all things, whatever we may ask of him. <clears throat> we present in our prayer the prayer of Christ, his intercession. 1 John 5, 14, 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, and according to his will is in the format of the intercession of Christ, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we may ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. We clearly know that we will receive what we're asking <clears throat> into the heart. We know that if we presented any pro promise in the format of the intercession of Christ, then God will absolutely hear it and respond to it. We know that boldness is a legal right giving us power to enter the presence of the Lord by the means of two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. This is the blood of the cross of Christ and the twelve loaves that are brought into the holy place and are offered to God upon the golden table that is built by us within our wise heart. The blood of the cross of Christ and the twelve loaves upon the golden table of showbreads brought into the holy place of our heart is the elementary teaching of Christ abiding within our heart, containing the power of the death and the power of the resurrection of Christ. 
the result of such abiding of the death and the resurrection of Christ within our heart is the rightful eating of the body of the Son of Man and rightful drinking of the blood of the Son of Man. John 6, 53-57 Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. When he dies, he dies. With resurrection, this resurrection remains in his body, although it is dead. It goes nowhere. It remains within the body. If you will take or attempt to destroy this body, you will not be able to destroy. You can't destroy material. <clears throat> you can burn it. You can scatter all over the face of the world. But in this, in these ashes, in this, in these remaining elements, is the life of God. Some people say, I want you to uh, let their ashes go, uh, some towards the mountain and others towards the other direction, thinking that can't be put together or gathered again. God will be able to gather these things and, and you will be in the day of judgment before him. Not having these two within our heart, we will not have the right to be dressed into our intercession in the form of the intercession of Jesus Christ to present within our intercession the interests of the perfect will of the Father. Summing up this given condition, we conclude that growing and developing the fruit of upright joy is only that intercession that is able with boldness be brought forth before God in the format of the intercession of Jesus Christ, so that you satisfy the exact requirements of the intercession of the Son of God. Now, question four, by what sign do we need to examine ourselves that we truly possess the fruit of upright joy in prayer? and not some kind of falsification or counterfeit. The first sign by which we need to examine ourselves as to whether we have within our heart upright joy in prayer. And so again, having this sign and, and examining ourselves, we examine ourselves by the presence of hope. Do I have this upright joy or not? By the presence of hope and the enrichment of the hope within our heart. Romans 15:13. Now may God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15:13. Again, pay attention here. It's a very interesting thing. God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. According to the given place of Scripture, the hope of our calling is the wellspring of our joy and peace and faith, as well as an expression of this joy. It is the spring from which we receive it and an expression of the joy. <clears throat> That's hope, which serves as legal grounds for receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, by which we are called to be enriched in hope or become rich in hope. When God is called by the name of hope, <clears throat> then this allows him to fill us with all joy and peace and faith that we may, by the power of the Holy Spirit, become rich with his hope. The word hope contained in the name of God directs to the good thoughts or plans of God containing the inheritance of his redemption, which he purposed before the generation and glory of the chosen by him remnant. God cannot wait for man to rely upon him or trust his life to him if he from his side will not give man specific evidence that he is not only <clears throat> his only hope of salvation, but also that he yearns greatly and is able to be that hope for man. It is the same with man. He is not able to wait for God to become the master of his life and his hope if he does not trust his life to God in accordance to the requirements written in Scripture. <clears throat> Let us look at what hope is in Hebrew. This is not the complete set of definitions, but these are some of them. I think this will be sufficient. Hope is something you can boast about. <clears throat> hope is knowing God and the ability to differentiate His voice from other voices. Hope is waiting for the coming and calling joy. Hope is inheritance that contains the complete series of God's promises. 
Hope is an immovable foundation of our salvation. Hope is renewal of strength of the resurrection of Christ. Hope is the foundation and material for building men into a spiritual house. Hope is the truth in action demonstrating the greatness of redemption. Hope is waiting for Christ to come from heaven. Hope is yearning, trust, strive and focus for the future. Hope is convincing, confirmation. It's also confidence in the future. Hope is safety, a tower of safety. Hope is covering from the wrath of God. Hope is the power of perseverance and comfort. Hope is power that overcomes sorrow. And hope is also a rope. You may say, what do you mean a rope? If you remember when there are two witnesses in Jericho, when he said, when we leave, throw a rope over the window, we will see this sign and we will leave your building untouched. And so this is, this wasn't as much for the Israelite people, I hope, but the angels for the angels, this was a sign. When those who study these archaeologists and so forth studied Jericho, they, they see that Jericho wasn't, the buildings weren't just destroyed. <clears throat> they, they were actually pressed into the ground in such a way as knife is put into butter. And so Rahab, she was kept alive and her house, um, the one who had covered those two spies. She covered hope in herself. That is why. The two spies. Uh, people say, uh, uh, why did Joshua send these two spies? Because it was totally unnecessary. They know that they will destroy this place. But God through Ju uh, uh, Joshua had told, uh, had he inspired him to do this, and, and they went, and when they were seeking, she hid them uh, in her house and covered them. And she told them, we, we know the power of your God. And then she told them, when you go, go in this direction. And when the other uh, when when the soldiers came to find out where these two spies were or which direction they went she directed those soldiers into the to the other direction or towards the other direction and so from this line from her line came Jesus this hope the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word of God the thing is specifically the level of rich richness of hope that you have will the level of the richness of our faith be because our faith is called and is able to fulfill those promises that are contained in the treasury of hope that are contained within our heart and to transform them from the unseen into the seen and the greater uh, the level of our hope be that abides within the treasury of our heart will the level of our faith be as well listen my beloved brethren has God not chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him James 2 5 we need to understand that the richness of our faith is equal to the richness or wealth of our of our hope due to this uh, unique uh, equality or in level or levelness of our faith and hope within our heart we will then receive this crystal sea that is that looks like the crystal sea if you remember uh, that uh, Josh, uh, John had seen the sea and it looked like crystal and the four living creatures and from the throne proceeded lightning, thundering and voices, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God before the thrones there was a sea of glass like crystal and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back 
And so all precious stones uh, have this crystal structure, and those that are non-precious uh, stones that don't have this crystal structure. Crystal is that when the light hits it, uh, when it comes out the other way, it has, from one ray, it turns into numerous rays from the other direction. A precious stone, when light goes through it, there, there's this kind of thing that happens. And so this uh, sea as crystal, the sea that is, are the 12 walls of the great Jerusalem. There's the breastplate of judgment also, the 12 gates, all, all are within this sea of glass-like crystal. And it says that around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. You know, the eyes are revelations of the Holy Spirit. Revelations of the Holy Spirit filled for front and back, full of eyes and uh, front and back. When you have this sea, you have this foundation. This foundation is your hope, this unique balance between hope and faith. Faith cannot be without hope. Hope is given and faith then takes from the hope and makes it happen. If you have within your bank, this is not faith, this is hope. What's in your bank account is your hope. And faith takes. Hope uh, is what's consisted there. And so there's the difference between faith and hope. They're, they're different. They have different functions. One is the bank, the treasury that contains the promises of God, and the other takes of those promises. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And so what we wait for what is, is what it takes from. Because of this balance between our hope and our faith, the confessions of our faith will flow from the built within our heart throne of God and the Lamb, and this river of life as crystal. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne and God of the Lamb. Revelations 22, 1. Our heart needs is called to be the throne of God and the Lamb. From there will the pure river of life flow as well. We know well that the crist crystal structure also symbolizes the order of God, his theocracy. The next segment by which we need to determine within ourselves hope from which the fruit of upright joy grows and is increased is the expression of immovability or the strength of hope, say immovability or strength, the, the firmness of our hope in the moment where we are tested. A song of ascents, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever, Psalm 125, 1. Where it says a song of ascents, a song of ascents is a song of worship. So when they worship, they went up, up on the hill and would go together as a group and sing. For Jews, Jerusalem, especially the 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 mountain uh, or hills uh, where the temple was was very sacred for them just even driving to Jerusalem was very sacred you need to understand how they look at Jerusalem when I first time came to Israel and we were walking from the Red Sea and we were passing uh, to Israel to be able to end up in Jerusalem, you need to drive like four hours on a taxi. And so we took a taxi, uh, a very kind young lady that uh, pretty much was at the at the border and she spoke with us in Russian. She, she knew we spoke Russian. First, uh, uh, to, to, uh, the one that was actually following uh, or accompanying us so that we can uh, uh, enter pretty much Jerusalem asked her do you speak German and she said no uh, they were trying. They were trying. We were trying to speak with her in English, and she, and she didn't understand it as well, and neither did we. And then she spoke clean Russian, and 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 I asked her where did you come from, and she and she said where did you where, where did you come from to 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 speak such good Russian, and she said I was born here in in Israel. 
And she said, my parents were never in Russia. She, she said, when more than a million or two million uh, Jews who spoke, speak Russian came here, they were very wealthy people uh, and don't want to speak uh, the, the, the Hebrew language. They're very wealthy people and live here. And so we, uh, we work for them and we needed to learn the Russian language in order to work for these people. And so they speak Russian uh, quite well, actually, in those places. And so when we were going and we approached Jerusalem, he, he was telling me, we are coming to Jerusalem, he told me. He was trying to tell us in English. He says, do you smell the, do you smell Jerusalem? And I see how he reacts. He doesn't understand much about the Bible. He's saying, he says, it's written in the Bible this, and, and, and I, I would say, no, it's not written this way. It's written here. And he was very, he's not very knowledgeable about the scriptures, but as soon as he approached uh the 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 board of Jerusalem when he goes to Jerusalem he especially washes himself because this is a very holy city for him and so Jews treat Jerusalem however they may be as something very holy and sacred and they wait for when God will cleanse it from the unclean Muslims but this will soon happen God already used our president who had announced Jerusalem as the Jewish capital and announced that the consul will be moved there and the people there are complaining now but God is doing his work they can complain but God will do his work you will break your back trying to lift this kind of weight for those complaining that's what's written in Zechariah. The next component by which we need to identify whether we have hope that by which uh, the upright uh, joy of God uh, increases and grows is the ability to be renewed in, in strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with uh, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 30 through 31. They shall re be renewed in strength by two wings. Uh, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, the next component by which we need to identify the presence of hope in ourselves, which by which uh, this fruit of upright joy grows and is increased, is the ability to boast about this hope. We boast for what is in the bank, but not in our household itself. That is what we boast about. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so we boast about the future, the hope that we have, that it's ours. Romans 5, 1 through 2. The next component by which we need to determine the presence of hope within ourselves. This hope is why the, our fruit of upright joy grows and increases, is the ability to know God. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own, John 10, 14. In the Greek lexicon, the word to know God includes knowing, finding out, to be saturated one in the other, notice, comprehend, understand, and accept. It talks about the full knowledge of, of God and the hope you have in God. And so for these people, God will truly be a stronghold in the time of sorrow, whether this be sorrow in some kind of loss or in poverty or sickness or persecution, whatever it may be. God will know his own by their hope upon him when they at the time of sorrow will run to him and in the midst of great sorrow will rejoice about having the hope they have. The Lord is good and stronghold in the day of trouble and he knows those who trust him. Naum 
And so those who do not hope in him, God does not know them. God does not have a relationship with them. The next segment by which we need to identify within ourselves the presence of hope from which this fruit of upright joy grows and increases is the ability to wait from wait for Christ from heaven. And then he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the age he has appeared but to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him he will appear a second time, apart from sin for salvation, Hebrews 9, 26 through 28. Waiting for Christ in, from heaven is such a form of perseverance that has a foundation of hope and trust upon God. The absence of waiting for Christ from heaven is not having this perseverance of Christ and not having faith and a good conscience because perseverance of Christ is the course of our faith. Having faith and a good conscience which some have rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.19 Shipwreck in, of our faith is the willing and colla, uh, willing collaboration of our conscience with the enemies of our faith. This is impatience and going before your time. At the same time, victory over our enemies with of our faith over our enemies and our good conscience is the willing and collaborative effort of our faith to collaborate with the Word of God. And so as perseverance or hope is uh, has to do with perseverance, we more than once paid attention to the enemy which is uh, impatience. And as we more than once noted, ignorance that is linked to impatience is not just not knowing the truth of God, but also open rejection of the truth for the benefit of your own interpretations. My people shall be destroyed for a lack of knowledge, because if you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest to me, because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Hosea 4.6 an insufficiency of, of knowledge is refusing to accept this knowledge in accordance to God's requirements. That first of all is rejecting hope, uh, hoping upon the mind of Christ and hoping upon your own mind instead. Considering that our time is up, we will bend our knees and we will pray and thank God for the word that he has given to us today that we had the opportunity to hear may it be imprinted upon our hearts may meditating about it we will bring it to action let us pray <coughs> Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ we worship before you upon this blessed place that you have appointed and keep and surrounded with your protection so that your children would be coming to this place, be able to come to this place and hear your word and would be able to grow themselves in relationship with you. Upon this place you've done a great work that your children would be able to have fellowship with each other by, which, by the means of which you would be able to cleanse us with your blood and the, by the means of which you can connect to your family and we would be a partaker of your line, your family. Because of this fellowship upon this place that your hand has appointed, we can be a partaker of your godly nature. May this place be blessed now and further and up until we are raptured and we thank you for that. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your protection. We know that the enemy has more than once attempted to remove this place, destroy it, but you have kept it for us. Not looking at this, we know upon any place that we will gather, there will your presence be. But when we gather upon the place that you have appointed, that you have given, and that we had purchased, paid a price for, 
For you, this is especially important that we have sacrificed our time, our means to have communication upon this place with you. May your holy people be blessed now and further. May we have and we thank you for that healing we have in hope that's upon our account. This healing, I believe, will finally take its form soon. Not looking at the fact that you heal your holy nation, but the time will come when there will be a great healing when you will dress us into our new person. Being dressed into our new person, not a single form of sickness will have access to our mortal body. In this way, you will adopt our body and show the victory of your redemption on earth. And we in the flesh will see you, as Job once said, I in the body will see the Lord. Many years had passed where he was suffering in his illnesses, but he continued to live and wait and hoped upon you, even though people generally <coughs> lived only a few months with the sicknesses he had. But he lived for several years, but you cleansed his body, you restored him, and you double, you poured out a double measure of blessing upon him. You restored what he had lost. And I believe that those children of yours that will continue to be faithful, you as the God of patience and comfort, God of all hope, hope by which we rejoice, and that's the joy we have in you. I believe that everything we've lost will be restored double-fold. Our healing will come as well and I believe that you will do this work otherwise you would not have revealed this revelation and this truth to us you said if I gave you the ability to conceive I will give you the ability to bear and we rejoice about this and we thank you not looking at our weaknesses and our sicknesses our losses we continue to look at what we have in you and not what we've lost and we actually don't lose we don't lose what is imperishable, we only lose what is perishable by obtaining what is imperishable. You will also then keep and preserve what is falling apart and restore it. May your children be blessed now and forever, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.